So, I bought this book a while ago. It's called Woman's Friendship. I bought it from an op shop um, down the road. And got it for only $12. That's New Zealand dollars, so I don't know. I'm not actually sure what that is in any other currency off the top of my head. But one thing that's really interesting to me is this note that's left. Um, I think this is Florence. I can't make out any of the other words. I think that could say from. I'm not sure. And then I, this is like a date. Um, and all I can make out is what I think is the 20th, 1878, which, this is an old book, um, and it isn't, isn't in the greatest state, and I'd like to give it a go and try and repair it at some point, but it's also got the shiny golden Ages, which is so cool. Also, you can probably hear my computer. Um, I don't know if you can see the reflection, but it's giving off. It's got RGBs. Um, but basically, I had it on. I thought, well, I could turn it off, but then I prefer videos that have some white noise. So, I'll leave it. So, if you don't like that, then it's not for you. <laughs> So I'm just going to read, I started reading it recently, but I'd like to start off. It has amazing artwork. It's really quite amazing. It was one of the main reasons that I got it, was when I saw this. And also, Woman's Friendship, like, what a cool book. <laughs> Woman's Friendship, A Story of Domestic Life by Grace Aguila To show us how divine a thing a woman may be made. And from Wordsworth, it's a quote. This was printed in London. 1877 by Groombridge and Sons. Okay. Woman's Friendship, Chapter 1. Friendship demands equality of station, true affection devoid of selfishness. Beware, dear Florence. I fear this warm attachment must end in disappointment. Fully as I can sympathise in its present happiness, was the warning address of Mrs. Leslie to an animated girl, who, on the receipt of a note and its rapid perusal, had bounded towards her mother with an exclamation of irrepressible joy. Disappointment, dearest mother? How can that be? was her eager reply. Because friendship, even more than love, demands equality of station. Friends cannot be to each other what they ought to be, if the rank of one party be among the nobles of the land, that of the other lowly as your own. That's a fern. <laughs> so I told her, dear mother, at least so my manner must have said, for she once called me a silly girl to be so terrified at rank, and asked me if I fancied, because lady was prefixed to her name. It raised up an impassable barrier between Ida Villiers and Florence Leslie. I loved her from that moment. No doubt, replied her mother, smiling. Yet, my Florence, I wish the first friendship your warm heart had formed had been with some other than its present object. You do not know how often I have longed for you to find a friend of your own sex, and nearly of your own age, on whom to expend some of those ever-gushing affections you lavish so warmly on me and Minnie. And my father and Walter, do I not love them? Laughingly interrupted Florence, kneeling down to caress her mother as she spoke. 
Nay, if I must enumerate all whom Florence loves, I believe we must add Minnie's kitten and Walter's greyhound, and all the mute animals which come to her for protection and care, rejoined Mrs. Leslie in the same tone. But nevertheless, I have longed for you to find a friend, because I feel you stand almost alone. Alone, mother? With you and Minnie? How can you speak so? Have I ever wished or sought another? No, love, but that is no reason why your mother should not wish it for you. Minnie is a pet, a plaything for us all. Younger in looks and manner than thirteen years may justify, and no companion for your present pursuits and opening pleasures. But are not you? I cannot be to you all I wish, my warm-hearted girl, for all your fancy pictures me, replied Mrs. Leslie, with difficulty suppressing emotion. Confined as I am, almost continually, to a sofa or bed, often incapacitated from the smallest exertion, even from hearing the gay laughter of my children, my sufferings are aggravated by the painful thought that now you need fem female companionship and sympathy, and more than ever, I cannot give them. A few years ago you were still a child, and your natural light-heartedness bore you up against all that might seem melancholy in your home. But within the last year I have observed that my sufferings have too often infected you with more sadness than they afflict upon me, and continually to watch with me, and to bear with me, and think for me. This is no task for you, my Florence. It is so precious even in its sorrow that I would not resign it for anything that other friends might offer, dearest mother. It is only the last two years I have been conscious of all I owe to you, and all you endure and all the trouble and sadness my willfulness must often have occasioned you. And if I seemed more thoughtful and serious, it is because I have only now begun to think and feel. And for that very reason, my child, I have wished you to find some friend whose affection and personal character might sometimes give you more cheerful matters of meditation and a happy change of scene. You are only too prone to think and feel and might become morbidly sensitive before either of us had imagined the danger. I know, too, that there is an age when the young require more than their natural relatives, whom to respect and love. They fancy it no credit to be loved merely in their domestic circle. They need an interchange of sentiment and pursuit, and all their innocent recreations and graver duties acquire double zest from being shared by another. Sympathy is the magic charm of life, and a friend will both give it and feel it, and never shrink from speaking the truth however painful, kindly indeed, but faithfully, and will infuse and receive strength by the mutual confidence of high and religious principle. Trust me, there are such friends, my Florence, friends that will cling to each other, through weal and through woe, who will never permit coldness or distrust to creep in, and dull their truth. Ay, and who will stand by, protecting and comforting, should sorrow or even sin be the lot of the one, and that of the other be happiness complete. Mrs. Leslie ceased, her voice becoming almost inaudible from emotion or exhaustion. Florence imagined the latter cause, for there was a deep flush on her mother's usually pallid cheek, which alarmed and pained her, and throwing her arms around her neck, she begged her not to talk too much. Dearly as she loved to hear her, adding, somewhat mournfully, You have indeed pictured true friendship, mother, and that which I yearn for. Lady Ida may be all this to me, but I am too lowly in station and in merit to be such to her, though I do feel I could go to the world's end to make her happier than she is. Oh, mother, if you did but know her as I do. Without that pleasure, my dear child, I have seen enough of her to know that, were her rank less high, I could not wish a dearer and truer friend for Florence. A character like yours, almost too clinging to affectionate, needs the support of firmness and self-control. Qualities I have never seen possessed in a more powerful degree than by Lady Ida. But remember, my Florence, it was not only the disparity of rank which must eventually separate you. Lady Ida is about to leave England to reside in Italy for an indefinite time. And with my whole heart I wish you could set off directly, lonely as I should feel, exclaimed Florence eagerly. No doubt you do. For there never was any selfishness in true affection, be it friendship or love. Yet I still wish there had been no occasion for the self-renunciation, and that your first friendship had not been with one from whom you will be so soon be called upon to part. 
but I would not lose the pleasure of the present to escape the pain of the future. You know, dear mother, I always say, I feel that pleasure and pain are twins. I never feel one without the other, and I should be a poor miserable being, miserable being without a particle of spirit or animation if I were to give up the joy of the one feeling for fear of the suffering of the other. There was an indefinable expression of sadness on the countenance of Mrs. Leslie, as her mild eye rested on the beaming features of her child. It was an expression which others might often have remarked, but when observed by Florence, she believed it natural to those beloved features, marking perhaps greater suffering of body than usual, and in consequence calling forth increased tenderness on her part. It is too late to wish, you, to wish the present pleasure recalled, my child. Continue to love Lady Ida. Only remember there must be a cloud in your horizon of joy, that this intimacy cannot last even if she return to England. Your respective stations cannot permit the confidence of perfect friendship, and my Florence has too much of her mother's pride to seek to be a humble friend. I could never be such to Lady Ida, replied Florence, for she would cease to love me, or at least to feel the same interest in me, in me if I were. No, mother, no. I am not ashamed to stand in a lower grade than hers. I shall never become one of those despicable characters, who, attempting to rise above, sink lower than their natural station, and thus expose themselves to laughter and contempt. Chapter 2 The Leslie Family A Mystery Love of Country Affected by Associations the family of whom the animated speaker of the preceding chapter formed so engaging a part consisted of Mr. and Mrs. Leslie and their three children. They had resided for several years in the lovely little village of Babicombe, situated on the south coast of Devonshire. Devonshire? <laughs> Occasional visits had indeed been made to the metropolis and other parts of England, but their home was Devonshire, and they had the affections of Florence taken root. With all the enthusiasm of her nature, London, she abhorred. She fancied its denizens were cold and heartless, and her mind had not yet received the magic touch which could awaken it to those treasures of art and science which the emporium of England's glory so richly contains. As yet, the music of the birds and streams, and the deeper bass and buried tones of ocean, were sweeter harmonies than the rarest talent of the capital. The opening flowers, the diversified scene of hill and dale, the groups of village children, of sturdy peasants and rustic girls, amid the fields and orchards, presented to her fancy lovelier pictures and more perfect forms than the finest galleries of art. The feelings and mysteries of her own loving heart and simple mind presented enough variety. She needed not change of society to develop her intuitive perception of character reading with avidity all that she could obtain, history, poetry, romance, all that could de delineate nature according to the responses of her own heart. She needed no other recreation. The gentle counsels of Mrs. Leslie preserved her from all that mawkish sentiment and undue prominence of romance, which in some dispositions might have resulted from such indiscriminate reading at an age so early. But Florence Leslie was no heroine. Heroine, heroine, oh my goodness. To take a volume of Byron or more and wander alone amid the rocks and fells and woods of Babacombe and weep in secret, imagining herself to be some lovelorn damsel and pining for all the fascinating heroes of whom she read. That she was often seen tripping lightly on an early summer morning or a cool fresh evening down the hill to a favourite cleft in a rock almost hidden by luxuriant brushwood which covered it, and within hearing of the sonorous voice, oh, sonorous voice of old ocean, and seen too with a book in her hand, we pretend not to deny. But look not aghast, ye votaries of Byron and Moore, that volume was generally one of Felicia Hemans or Mary Howitt, or if of deeper lore, Wordsworth, Coleridge, the stirring scenes of Scott, or the domestic pictures of Edgeworth, Mitford, or Austen. Florence was not yet old enough, or perchance wise enough, 
to appreciate the true poetic beauties of Lord Byron's thrilling lays, or the sweeter, softer music of Moore. She was as yet only sensible of that which pleased her fancy and touched her heart, and therefore, to these poets, her gentle spirit echoed no reply. But Florence was not so wedded to her books and shrubs and flowers as to Essa <laughs> who, oh my goodness, Essa who, those pleasures which might perhaps appear somewhat irrelevant to such a quiet life. No one loved a ball so well, no one was so lightly gay in all festivity and mirth. The morning hour might see her in tears over her favourite book. The evening find her the life and centre of a happy group of children, laughing and dancing like the youngest there. Such she was at the age of fifteen. Seventeen years found this internal and external happiness somewhat clouded. She became more awake to outward things, to the consciousness of and sympathy with the sufferings of a mother whom she loved with no common love. For the last five years, Mrs. Leslie had been labouring under an incurable disease, which not only always debilitated her frame, producing a languor and depression under which many a mind would have sunk, but exposed her at intervals to the most excruciating suffering, which she would yet bear so uncomplainingly, so heroically, that very often the damp drops on her bow, brow, or a fainting fit would be the first sign that she was enduring pain. A sudden and violent disease would have alarmed and thus excited the attention even of a child, but Mrs. Leslie's complaint had crept on so silently and unexpectedly. Her languor and weakness were so successfully com combated that it was not strange that Florence should have failed to observe them at first, and that when she did so, the fact should have dashed her glowing visions with a saddening shade. She felt the pleasures of gaiety were alloyed, for she could never join in them with her mother. True, the yearning for something more to love was not strong enough to affect her happiness, for when by Mrs. Leslie's side, listening to her loved counsels, or caressing her young and joyous sister Mary, or Minnie, as she was also called, she felt it not. It was only when taking a ramble too long for Minnie, or joining in the pleasures of evening society for which Minnie was too young, and which for Miss which were for Miss, Miss oh my goodness, and which were for Mrs. Leslie too painful an exertion, that she was conscious she might be happier still. There was an ardent longing in Florence Leslie's heart from her earliest years, which most people imagined, but romantic folly engendered by indiscriminate reading and a consequent love of adventure, but which, strange to say, always appeared to cause Mrs. Leslie some uneasiness. All that concerned Italy, from the driest history, the deepest antiquarian research, to the lightest poem, were poured over with a personacity, a constancy, which no one but Mr. and Mrs. Leslie, perhaps, could comprehend. Roger's poem she committed to memory, page after page, simply for recreation. And she learned to draw, chiefly in order to copy every print of Italy, modern or ancient, which came before her. What would I not give to have some claim on that lovely land, she said one day, when only twelve years old. It is so foolish merely to love. Now if I had by some strange chance been born there, I might love Italy as much as I pleased. By the way, Papa, where was I born? I have asked Mamma several times, and there seems a fatality attending her answer, for I do not know yet. Mr. Leslie's face was shaded by his hand and it was twilight, or Florence must have discovered that his countenance was slightly troubled. But he answered quietly, If you so much wish to forswear poor old England as your birthplace, my dear child, you have my permission to do so. For in truth, if to be born in a country makes you a child of the soil, you are Italian, having first seen the light about twenty miles from the fair town whose name you bear. Italian? Really, truly Italian? Oh, you dear, good father, do tell me so. Now may I love it as much as I please. Italy, dear beautiful Italy, I am your own child. Mamma, naughty mamma, she continued, bounding to Mrs. Leslie as she entered the room. Why did you never tell me I was Italian? I must go and tell Walter and nurse. 
and away she flew, utterly unconscious of the agitation her words had produced in Mrs. Leslie, who, as the door closed behind her, sank on a chair by her husband's side, faintly exclaiming, Edward, dearest Edward, what have you told her? Nothing, dearest, trust me, nothing that can in any way disturb her serenity or happiness, or excite the least suspicion in herself or others. Inimical, inimical to her present or future peace. I did but tell her she was born in Italy, which, did she ever mingle with the, my family, she would find many to confirm. And you know it is but the truth, dearest wife. Mrs. Leslie breathed more freely. I am very weak and very foolish, she said after a pause. But the slightest reference to her birth utterly unnerves me. Dearest Edward, they come to me at times such horrible forebodings, as if we had scarcely done right to act as we have done. And yet it was my own request, my first weighty boon, and not granted by you without a painful struggle. If there be fault, if evil come of it, I have brought it on myself. Do not speak thus, my noble Mary, was her husband's instant reply, pressing her as he spoke to his bosom. What fault can there be in acting as you did? What evil can come from it to dash your noble deed with woe? If she should ever learn, faintly murmured Mrs. Leslie, ever know the truth. It is not likely she ever will, nor can there be any need she should. Loved, cherished, ay, and dutiful and affectionate as she is, God grant that she may never leave her home till she quits it for a happier one. Amen, fervently responded Mrs. Leslie. And what further might have passed between them was checked by the re-entrance of their child. As Florence outgrew the period of childhood, and merged into opening womanhood, there was something in the intense blackness of her large, lustrous eye, the glossy tresses of her long, jet-black hair, the rich complexion, which though refined and rendered peculiarly delicate from the effects of an English climate, was certainly more brunette than blonde. It seemed in truth to mark her of more southern origin than her mother and little sister. Between whom and herself, there was no affinity of feature whatever. Minnie was a lovely English child, exquisitely fair, with deep blue eyes and clustering curls of gold, and a voice that, even at twelve years old, was something so extraordinary in its compass, its flexibility, that many a professor might have envied her the gift. Florence was no regular beauty, but very graceful, with a modest and winning manner, and an ever-varying expression of feature, which rendered her a most lovable creature. Flattery, Florence instinctively abhorred, but if anyone told her her eyes and complexion were more Italian than English, she would be as innocently delighted as a child with a new toy. The other child of Mr. and Mrs. Leslie was a delicate boy, two years the junior of Florence, between whom and himself many an animated discussion was wont to take place on what they termed the respective merits of their respective countries. On one of these occasions, Florence met the glance of her mother, full of that sorrowful meaning which she had only lately learned to remark, and she hastened towards her to cover her with caresses, and ask if she could do anything to alleviate her pain. Mamma does not like to hear you abuse old England, was Walter's laughing rejoinder, as her mother assured her she was not suffering. I did not abuse it. I love it, Walter, but I love Italy more, and Mamma loves it too. Not better than England, Florence. Not so well. Look at her eyes. Florence did look, and seemed disappointed. Mrs. Leslie smiled. I have passed many happy, but more sorrowful days in Italy, my dear children. And, as we generally love a country from association, I candidly own it, would give me more pain than pleasure to visit those classic shores again. There! exclaimed Walter, triumphantly. It is not likely I shall ever have the happiness of seeing them, so let me love on, at least, rejoined Florence in a sorrowful tone. I think I will pause it there and we can come back for more soon. You can see the state of this book. 
quite sad. But I wonder how I could try to fix it. I know that you put the thread through the holes in the page. And that goes taut. Oh, you can't see. It's a string. And you go back and forth and weave it through the pages. And you can see. Oh dear. I think that's repairable though because you can see the knitting. Regardless. Can come back to that. Oh no. There we go. Chapter three. And I'll come back to. You.